Let me ask you, how do you feel about yourself? Feel good? You feel bad? You feel okay? Depends on what day it is. It depends on circumstances. You know, one of the life issues that we, we find that really pulls us down so often is life, in life is related to our self-esteem, our self-understanding. It's really interesting, the, the, just the word itself has a lot of reaction. It evokes a lot of reaction where uh, some will say, oh, no, you know, we don't want to hear a positive self-image sermon. Well, I don't either, and I don't want to preach one. But there's a lot of that out there today, and the problem is that it's not grounded in God's Word. It's not centered in truth. And a lot of it is just self-help cycle babble about trying to feel better and to do better, but it still leaves people empty. Uh, I googled the word self-esteem, uh, and there are over 5 million links uh, that are related to self-esteem. Then I typed self-esteem industry, and there were almost 9 million different links that you can go to about self-esteem. And there are a lot of articles particularly related to teenage girls about where they find their self-esteem and the problem uh, of, of the, the failure that the culture is providing as it relates to social media. There are many, many links concerning those who take selfies. Now, if you don't know what a selfie is, you're, you're, you're out of it. You just, the world's passed you by if you don't know what that is. But a lot of the young people understand that. A lot, a lot of implications to that. Uh, that, that sociologists talk about. But what we find is that those who have a poor self-image or a poor self-esteem, it leads to poor relationships. It leads to poor work performance. It leads to depression. It leads to physical illnesses, psychosomatic diseases that we talked about several weeks ago. It creates problems. Now, we need to understand God's perspective about that, and he addresses that. And, and sometimes when we think about self-esteem, you know, the, we say, well, the Bible really doesn't address that issue. We shouldn't talk about it in church. Well, I want you to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to find how God's Word clearly speaks to this issue and how we can determine who it is that defines for us who we are. And that's a really good question that you need to stop and ask yourself, who determines who I am, or how I feel about myself, the way that I view life, who or what is it that determines that, and who's establishing the way that I think about myself. And God makes it very clear in His Word where that source should come from. All right? Genesis chapter 1, that's several points that I want to make, and we're going to look at several passages of Scripture rather than anchoring on one as I would typically do. But because of this topic, there are several points that I really want to make and tie the whole thing together. First of all, here's what the Bible says. It says about you. It says that you are created in the image of God. You are created in the image of God. That's where we have to begin. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Notice that's plural, not singular. The Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. Where's what God is saying? You're not just created. You're created in the image of God. You're not just here on your own. It's not just you, but God has his stamp on you. When we talk about the image of God and being in his likeness, it means that God's stamp is on you, that we can see God when we see people. Now, what does it mean that I'm created in the image, in the likeness of God? It doesn't mean, those doesn't mean, that does not mean two different things. In the language of the text, it's really helping to say the same thing. So what does it mean that I'm created in the image of God? You notice that God did not spell that out in this text. He doesn't have a list of characteristics that explain uh, what his image is like. Why? Because the readers understood exactly what this word meant. They understood that when you say that somebody is in its image or in its likeness, it doesn't mean that they're identical. It means that they're similar. They, they understood the word in the context of how it was used in that day and time. It's like the gospel writers, when they say Jesus was crucified, 
They don't explain the crucifixion. They don't embellish the crucifixion. Why? People saw the crucifixion. They heard the crucifixion. They smelled the crucifixion. They saw that happening day by day by day in the Roman Empire. They knew exactly what it meant. So when they said he was crucified, they knew how brutal of a death that was. And it's the same thing here about the image of God. It's that we are made in his likeness. Now, there are things that we could say. We have personality like God has personality. Uh, we have moral character like God has moral character, etc. As you read throughout the Bible, you can understand more of who God is and his attributes. And he has personality. We have personality, etc. But you are not a product. My point is this. You're not a product from random uh, uh, selective re- uh, evolutionary process. You were here by the intent and act of God. You were here by His purpose. He created you. It wasn't that two individuals decided that we're going to have a baby. It was that God, before the world was ever created, knew that you were going to be here. You're not here by accident. You're here by God's intent, by His purpose. Because of his love. And you can't understand who you are apart from knowing the one who created you. You, you, you cannot fully understand self. You cannot understand who you are and why you are here apart from knowing God. All this means that you're significant. You're valuable. Every human life is valuable. That's why we, 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 we talk about so much and we're committed so much to the value of every human life. Children who are adopted. Why, why is that? Because God created them in his own image and they have value. The elderly. We value the elderly. We value those who are disabled. Do You know, recently we had an event here at our church. A week ago Saturday, I believe it was, where we, we said in our own church and out in the community, if you have a teenager or an adult who is disabled, bring them to our church, and we're going we're gonna to have a, like a, a day camp here at the church so the parents can have time to themselves. Do you know that we had 44 individuals came, came that Saturday representing 44 families? Most of those have no connection to our church. Only about six to eight of those would be identified to our church. Why? Because we value those human lives. They matter to God. They should matter to us and to all of, all of society. So you're significant because God wants you here. The second thing you need to know that the Bible says is you're created in the image of God. But secondly, you are a sinner. You are a sinner. Well, pastor, that, 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 I don't understand why you're saying that. Well, because you cannot understand yourself until you get this point. Genesis chapter 3, we find that man had been created in the image of God, but something happened. He chose to sin against God. God created the potential for evil and suffering. As we we saw in this first sermon of the series, uh, man actualized it. God created the potential, but man chose to sin And as a result, suffering and evil and sin entered the world. And now, man's man's image, God's image in man, is not lost. It's distorted. It's marred. It's no longer the same because of sin. Our moral character is flawed now. God's is not. It never changes. But but we now find ourselves different as, as a result of sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, Paul says, In Adam all die. Romans 5, 12, Paul says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way death spread to all men, because all sinned. Romans 3, 23, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Man was created in an innocent state, bearing the image of God, but he sinned and is now separated from God. Now, why do I need to know that I'm a sinner? I mean, that's bad news. That's not helping my self-esteem right now. That's not making me feel good about myself. Because when you understand that you're a sinner, it helps, helps you understand who you really are and who you're not. Actually, this may be the most important point that some need to hear today. 
that, that, that I am a sinner. I come to terms with who I really am. Why is that? Number one, it makes me realize I'm not God. And so many of us act as though we are God. We are our own God. And we do whatever we want to and whatever we please. And because of that, that's why we have the problem with our self-image and self-esteem. We've not come to terms with the fact that I'm not God. I'm a sinner. It's not about me. It's about him. Secondly, admitting that I'm a sinner enables me to attack the problem of pride that all of us have in our lives. It's the first step toward a life of humility. Conviction leads to confection. Confession leads to change, to transformation. When I'm agreeing with God that I am indeed a sinner and I am separated because of my sin, and, and, and when I get to that point, I'm able to be honest about who I am. Because if I am not honest about who I really am, then I'm not understanding myself. And listen, self cannot be cured this is important yourself cannot be cured it has to be slain it has to be put to death it has to die Francois Fenelon was a, a, a man who uh, was a Christian uh, and he, he served in King Louis XIV's court he also became Archbishop of France later on he wrote this The point is not how you are to be sustained and kept alive, but how you are going to give up and die. A person who never understands his sin will never understand his self. Who I am, who I really am, needs to die. I I can't repair self. I can't make self feel better. I I can't change self. Self has to die. Self has to be put to death. It has to be slain before I can really understand who I am. But it doesn't end there, thank God, does it? I'm created in the image of God. I come to the point of understanding that I'm a sinner. But third, the Bible says that you are loved. That you are loved. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he loved you, that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He loved you. The cross is God's greatest expression of love to you. How do I know that God loves me, a sinner? If I come to terms with the fact that I am a sinner, that I've got a problem with self, nobody loves me. That's how you may approach it, from that back door. Nobody loves me. I don't love myself. The greatest expression of love from anyone is God's love on the cross. That even though you were a sinner, he died for you. Jesus did not die for good people. He died for bad people, sinners. He did not, you're not good in your natural state. We needed somebody to take care of the sin that's in our life. Romans 5, 8, but God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How does that affect, though, my self-esteem and self-image? Just knowing that God loves me and that he died for my sin. Well, it means, first of all, that you're forgiven of your sin. Paul writes in Colossians 1, 13, he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. So that I can be fully forgiven of my sin. Secondly, it means that I am righteous. Well, pastor, that sounds pretty arrogant to be able to say that you're righteous. Well, listen to how Paul says it in Romans 5. For just as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, that's Adam, so also through the one man's obedience, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, the many will be made righteous. What does righteous mean? I'm able to be right before God. I stand before him made right because of the blood of Jesus Christ. My sin's been taken away. I've been forgiven. And now I'm right with God. The relationship has been restored. And it means I'm blameless. A lot of people have a problem with their self-esteem or their self-image because of the guilt and the shame of their sin. And they still blame themselves. 
Paul says in Ephesians 1, 4, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. Pastor, I, I can't stand before God blameless. Oh, yes, you can in Christ. It takes care of all of that negative talk and all of that self-condemnation. Remember what John said, though our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. God is greater than the self-condemnation that we place on ourselves. And you can't, I don't care who you are or what you have done, you can stand before a holy God, blameless and righteous in his sight because of the blood of Christ. That ought to do something to your self-esteem and your self-image, knowing that, hey, I, I don't know how that's possible, but Boy, that ought to make us love the Lord all the more and to serve him all the more and to love others all the more because he has loved me. God's love through Jesus Christ also creates a new relationship for me. It means that I have a father who loves me. 2 Corinthians six eighteen, Paul is quoting the Old Testament where God says, I will be a father to you. Romans 8, we cry out, Abba, Daddy. Father, you may not have had an earthly father, you may have had a bad earthly father, but you have a perfect father in heaven who loves you unconditionally, loves you the way that you are, and you can see him as your father. Secondly, you have a new relationship in that you have a friend. John 15, 13, Jesus said, no one has greater love than this that someone lay down his life for his friends. You know, it's not a trite statement. That's not a blasphemous statement or sacrilegious statement to say that, that I'm a friend of God and that he's my friend. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. But in the true sense of the word, he is the friend like no other friend. He is the one true friend who will never fail me in the relationship that I need as a friend. It also means that I've been adopted, as we've heard about earlier. Galatians 4, Paul writes, God sent his son so that we might receive adoption as sons. We were orphans spiritually. Sin created an orphan relationship with God. But he adopted us, the Bible says, into a relationship with him. A perfect, perfect relationship being adopted. You know, my big prayer for my grandson, Liam, who was adopted from South Korea, I pray this every morning when I pray for Liam. God, when he understands what happened, help him to understand what happened. He's going to wake up one day and he's going to realize this is different, the family that I'm in. But I, I hope and pray, every day I pray, God, help him to truly understand what the Bible has said about him. That he is loved perfectly in a human relationship, but more importantly, that he'll make the connection spiritually that you, Father, want to adopt him into the big family. And that leads me to my last point. We have a family in Christ. Sometimes we feel all alone, don't we? But we are part of the body of Christ, the Bible says. It's not a perfect family. But it's a family that we're connected to because of the love of Jesus Christ. So what is, what is the point? The Bible says that you are loved. So many different ways that you are loved. We should never really say, no one loves me. I, I know what you mean by that and I know what I mean by that. But we should never really say that for those who are in Christ. Because I am loved, and so many approves of that. Notice also, what does the Bible say about you? You're a saint. You're a saint. Well, I don't feel like a saint. What does that mean? Well, Paul says in Philippians 4, Greet every saint in, G in Christ Jesus. Those brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you. It's a word that denotes the relationship that we have with each other and with God. That, that we are somebody, a saint, that no we're not perfect in any way but it just describes that the value of my relationship to him the word saint can also be translated holy or holy ones 
It means that, that God is holy and He wants us to be holy and that we as believers in Christ are to live a holy life, a life that is set apart. So when we think of the word saint, it means that God has, has, has chosen me into a special relationship with Him and that means that not only am I separated for Him, but I am separated from the world unto Him. Living in the world, we live in the world. But we're not of the world. We don't act like the world. We don't talk like the world. We don't live like the world. We are a saint separated out. That means then that your value. As a saint, it means that you have a responsibility. It means I have a mission that God wants me to live. We call that missional living. He wants me to make him known. It means that I have a grace-filled life. Not a law-filled life of rules and regulations in a relationship to God, but a grace-filled life that He has given me. But listen, then it means that I live by grace, in His grace. And I am demonstrating grace to others, God's grace. It means that I have a purpose. My purpose on this earth is to enjoy Him and to give glory to Him. Psalm 1611, in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 73, 25, whom do I have in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on earth but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. Psalm 84, 1, how lovely is your dwelling place, Lord of hosts. I long and yearn for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. Better a day in your courts than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be at the door of the house of my God than to live in the tents of the wicked. Revelation 4.11 Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things and because of your will they exist and were created. You and I, we're sinners Saved by grace, now living as saints in this world. Finally, what does the Bible say about you? You have hope. You have hope. You have hope today. Paul says in Romans 8, 28, my life verse, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. You see, circumstances often make us feel bad about ourselves or things about us make us feel bad about ourselves. But he says, you know, I'm working all those things, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm working all those things together for my good and for our good, for those who are called to his purpose. That means that God is at work right now. As bad as it may may be and as bad as you may feel, about yourself, God's at work. God, also, you have hope in eternity. At death, you have hope. Luke 23, Jesus said to the thief on the cross, I assure you, from this day on, you'll be with me in paradise. Even at death, it's okay. I have hope. I'll be with him. At the second coming of Christ, Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 4, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. You know, really, the real you never experiences death. The physical appearance of you experiences death. But you do not experience death. You continue to live forever. One place or the other, heaven or hell. But all of us have immortality. Physically, yes, we die. But there's never a moment that the real you is not awake, is not understanding where you are. Then also the Bible says that I'll be rewarded and those who have wronged me will also be rewarded. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. He says, I fought the good fight, I have kept the faith, I have finished the course. Now there is waiting for me a crown that the righteous judge will award to me. 
And not only to me, but all those who long his appearing. In the end, God's going to make it right. Life doesn't seem fair. And sometimes that gives us that poor self-image, a bad self-esteem. That life has just been unfair to me. I, I, I just, it's been so hard. And I've been so mistreated. Sometimes that's a perception. Sometimes that's reality. And if it's real, God is going to deal with those who have hurt you, those who wounded you. So you don't want to live there. You don't want to stay there. Go back to the sermon on bitterness. If I know that God's going to make it right and he's going to judge those who've wronged me, I'm not going to waste my time being bitter toward them, being angry toward them. It's the devil's trap. I know that God's going to make good on it, so I trust him. You'll be vindicated. You'll be rewarded. What does all that mean? You have hope. And listen, here's the big promise. It is going to get better. I don't care what's going on in your life. If you're trusting God, if you're living in Christ and in him alone, if you really understand what the Bible says about you, it is going to get better. It may get worse for a season, but there is an eternity that is waiting for us. And listen, it is going to be better. It is going to be right. It's going to be perfect. So what does all this mean? Your self-esteem is not determined by what others say about you, what you think about yourself, what Satan says about you. It's not determined by what you do vocationally. How talented you are, how you look or what you wear, or applying self-help, self-centeredness, self-help, psychobabble, that is not who defines who you are. Your self-esteem is determined by one thing, and that is by a God who created you, who loves you in spite of your sin, and is always with you, and is always going to help you, and is always going to lead you to a place that is far better, either he is right or he's a liar. It's one or the other. Either what God has said about you is true or he's a liar. So, well, I don't want to say God's a liar. So why not start believing the truth today? What God has said about you. Therefore, you have significant worth. You have conquering confidence. You have a purposeful life. Well, pastor, what do I do? I struggle with self-esteem, self-image. Hey, let me tell you something. Everybody in this room does. We all have insecurities. I was in a pastor, I mean, a meeting Monday and Tuesday with pastors in the Midwest. Uh, Church is about our size, and uh, it's the best meeting I go to all year. We just talk about our our problems, uh, our victories uh, in our church work and in our personal lives, and and one guy who, who is he's really well known, and he's just a great godly pastor. And he said, man, let me tell you where I'm struggling. And, and he talked about his insecurities, and it's centered around self-esteem, what others think about him. We all struggle with that. So what do I need to do? First of all, thank God for who you are in Christ. Thank him for creating you the way that you are. Have you ever said, I wish I looked like this? I wish I could do this. I wish I was like that other person. Stop all that. Stop it. Thank God for the way that he created you. You're not going to get any better until you start thanking him for who you are. Ask him to help you not listen to the lies of the enemy. Let me say it a little stronger. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy. Don't listen to them. They're lies. They're lies. And he has you right where he wants you because he knows that you're ineffective in God's service if you're staying there. So don't listen to him. Ask God to help you follow his will, his will, and to act on truth and not your feelings. Several years ago, the Gaithers wrote a song. I love this song. It says this. Maybe you don't feel like you have much to offer in life or to offer to God. Something beautiful, something good. 
All my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife. But he made something beautiful of my life. If there ever were dreams so lofty and noble, they were my dreams at the start. And hope for life's best were the hopes that I harbor down deep in my heart. But my dreams turned to ashes and my castles all crumbled. My fortune turned to loss. So I wrapped it all in the rags of my life and laid it at the cross. Something beautiful. Something good. All my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife. But he made something beautiful of your life. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? You might be here this morning and you would say, Pastor, I struggle with this so much. And if truth were to be known, I don't feel like I have anything to offer to anyone. And I I just, I just don't, I don't like myself. Well, there could be several reasons for that. But the good news is that God loves you. And He wants you to live in His image and His power. And his purpose. He wants you to live in truth, not a lie. So this morning, I want just to ask you and encourage you to just give it to the Lord. Self has to be crucified. It has to die. So if your focus has been on self, this morning, laid at the foot of the cross and say God I just give it all to you and I'm going to believe what you have said about me I'm no longer to believe what others have said about me or what others think what what circumstances have produced in my life that made me feel bad about me I'm giving it all to you and ask him to help you begin to live in that victory There's some of you here this morning who would say, Pastor, I, for the first time, realize that my sin has separated me from God. And and for the first time, I really understand what it means to be a sinner. And and I need to have my sin forgiven. There's only one way that can happen. And that's by not just believing what Christ did on the cross, but turning from your sin and turning to Him as your Lord and Savior beginning to follow him with your life and if you're not sure how to do that what steps to take in just a moment when we sing Kevin and I will be here at the front you come to one of us and we'll be able to help you make that commitment of your life to Jesus Christ there are others of you here that God is leading you to join our fellowship maybe just to come and pray and talk to the Lord about this or some other issue in your life here to help you don't miss this moment that God has for you God I thank you for your word and how true it is Lord how we we need to have the right perspective about who we are it's not about us it's all about you we're not the captain of our lives we're sinners but sinners saved by grace chosen to be your saint God I pray that we'll not listen to the lies of the enemy and that we'll make the commitment we need to make this morning in Jesus name